Kent Street press conference. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Chris Whitty, uh, Chief Medical Officer, and Sir Patrick Balance, uh, the Chief Scientific Advisor. Can I start with an update on the Prime Minister? He's still in intensive care, but he continues to make positive step forwards and he's in good spirits. And I can also report from the government's ongoing monitoring and testing programme that as of today, 243,421 people have been tested for the virus, 65,077 have tested positive, and the number of people admitted to hospital with coronavirus symptoms now stands at 16,784. And those who have contracted the virus, 7,978 have sadly died. And our thoughts and our prayers are with their families and their friends. The whole country has been practicing a stringent form of social distancing for three weeks now, precisely because we're doing everything we can to minimise the bleak numbers that I just read out. And for that, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's gone the extra mile during this very challenging period. Thank you to all of those who are looking after us in our time of need, the NHS workers on the front line who have treated the sick, saved lives, and tended for those who sadly could not be saved. For the doctors and nurses who have died of coronavirus whilst caring for others, we will never forget their sacrifice. We will never forget their devotion to helping others. I also want to say a big thank you to the carers, the charity workers, all those looking after or even just keeping an eye on those in their local neighbourhood. You are the lifeline to so many people in our communities. Thank you to the workers who keep the country running, the supermarket workers, the delivery drivers, the technicians, the cleaners, the public servants who just kept going, determined to keep providing the daily services that we all rely on. I think you've certainly made us all think long and hard about who the key workers are in our lives. Thank you to the volunteers who have stepped up across the country, whose big hearted sense of responsibility defines British community spirit at its very best. And a massive thank you to every single person who stayed home to stop this terrible virus from spreading. You've helped to protect the NHS and you've helped to save lives. Now, as we look on to the I uh, look forward to the long bank holiday Easter weekend. I know some people are going to start wondering, is it time to ease up on the rules? So I have to say thank you for your sacrifice, but also we're not done yet. We must keep going. Let me just explain a little bit about why that's so important. Today I chaired a COBRA meeting with uh, senior ministers, officials and represented representatives from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, as well as the Mayor of London so that we could take stock and assess where we are right across the United Kingdom. And at this stage, the government is continuing to gather all of the relevant data to obtain the fullest picture possible of the effects of the social distancing measures that we've put in place. Now, while the early signs suggest that they are having the impact that we need to see, it's too early to say that conclusively. SAGE will meet next week to discuss the latest evidence and will keep the measures we put in place under review. As we've said on many occasions now, we'll be guided by the science at all times. So we don't expect to be able to say more on this until the end of next week. And let me just be again very clear about this. The measures will have to stay in place until we've got the evidence that clearly shows we've moved beyond the peak. Now I know these restrictions take their toll, take their toll day in day out on people's livelihoods on people's quality of life, on people's mental health. And I appreciate that it's often the little things that hurt the most. With the Easter bank holiday uh, coming up, I'd normally spend it with my two boys, seven and five years old, with their grandparents doing an Easter egg hunt. And I know there's going to be lots of people who would normally be planning a family get together or just getting out in the sunshine with friends and loved ones. Unfortunately, right now, we just can't do those sorts of things. And I'm really sorry about that. But just take a moment to think of the progress that we've already made. Following the guidance, staying at home, denying the virus what it needs to spread more easily and to kill more people. 
It's been almost three weeks and we're starting to see the impact of the sacrifices we've all made. But the deaths are still rising and we haven't yet reached the peak of the virus. It's still too early to lift the measures that we've put in place. We must stick to the plan and we must continue to be guided by the science. Our top priority, our immediate priority remains to slow the spread of the virus and to save as many lives as possible. And that's why we have to continue to ask you all to keep complying with the guidance. And as we've said consistently from the outset, it's vital we take the right decisions at the right time. And the, mo and the most important thing right now is that people continue to follow the government's guidance until we've got the evidence that the virus is firmly under control. So that means please do stay at home to protect our NHS and to save lives. After all the efforts that everyone's made, after all the sacrifices so many people have made, let's not ruin it now. Let's not undo the gains we've made. Let's not waste the sacrifices so many people have made. We mustn't give the coronavirus a second chance to kill more people and to hurt our country. I know it's tough going, but this is a team effort and we'll only defeat this virus for good if we all stay the course. So please stay home this bank holiday weekend for everyone's sake. And I will turn to Sir Patrick to give us an update on the very latest data. Sir Patrick, you. Thank you very much. As the First Secretary has said, the measures that everybody has taken, the difficult things that we've all had to do, are making a difference, and they're making a big difference. We know that the social distancing is working and we know that people are doing what they're supposed to do and we need to keep doing that. And the reason we need to keep doing that is because it stops the transmission of the virus in the community and we know that that is already happening. Next slide, please. As a result of stopping the transmission in the community, we stop new cases appearing. And this slide the numbers go up and down a bit, but what you can see is it's not taking off in that sharp uptake. It's not gone sky high. And if anything, there might even be some flattening. That is because of what we're all doing with social distancing. If we had not done that, those cases would now be very much higher. If those cases were higher, next slide please, then this graph wouldn't look like this we would find many, many more people in hospital. We would find the health system potentially overrun. And what you can see on this graph is the increase in hospital admissions, people in hospital beds with COVID, and it has gone up across the country, but it's not gone up in that steep way. And again, if anything, we're beginning to see the first signs of this leveling off. Too early to be sure, too early to know that this is on the way down, but it's not got that fast upswing that it would have had, had you all, we all, not been doing what we are doing with these difficult measures of social distancing. And if the hospital beds were fuller, next slide please, then importantly, so would the intensive care units be even fuller. And people are working heroically in intensive care units to look after the very sick patients who are there. But again, this is not the sharp upstroke of big increases in numbers. It's a steady increase in numbers, which might just might be beginning to flatten off, but it's certainly not accelerating. That means that the NHS can cope. It's got the right numbers of beds with the new expansion in order to be able to cope with this. So if we were not doing what we're doing, and if we don't continue to do what we're doing in terms of the social distancing, we put all of this at risk. We jeopardise the thing that's allowed us to get to this position. And if I can have the last slide, please. Unfortunately, sadly, there are deaths from this disease. And those continue to rise. And you can see here the increase in rise in the UK and in other countries. This will not change for a few weeks because the deaths come after the other illnesses, the early illness, the intensive care, and then in some patients, unfortunately, die. And that will continue to increase for a few weeks. We need to see this begin to go down as well. It should follow the others. So the message is clear. 
which is the social distancing that we're all doing, is breaking transmission, it's stopping the hospital admissions, beginning to see that flattening off, still unbelievably busy, but beginning to see that flatten off. It's preventing more people going into intensive care and it will prevent deaths. It's incredibly important we continue to do what we're doing. Thank you, Patrick. Now, if we take some questions from the media, I think Hugh Pym from the BBC is first up. Hugh. Thank you. We've heard some harrowing stories of people dying alone because family can't be with them for understandable reasons to do with the virus risk. What do you say to the British public about how things will develop from here? Well, the first thing I would say is thank you for all you're doing, not just the key workers as essential as they are, and we applaud them uh, for the incredible work they've done, but also to every individual who's followed the advice and the guidance. But we've made progress. Patrick has set that out, I think, very clearly. Um, uh, but we don't know conclusively uh, that we're beyond uh, the point at which we could start considering whether the measures would be relaxed. So we must keep it up. And I think the key thing is for people to understand how much of what they've already done has helped contribute to uh, avoiding an even worse situation in terms of the spread of the virus and the number of deaths and how important it is that we don't uh, uh, slow up or, or take our pressure off at this critical moment before we've come through the peak. So we recognise the sacrifices so many people have made. It's a team effort. Uh, and as a country, we need to be united in this mission. We've got to keep it up. Did you want to come back with anything further, Hugh? Maybe, maybe to um, uh, Patrick Valance, or a little bit more on the death projections that you, that you have got. I know it's difficult, but uh, how long and how fast you, could, you expect the deaths to carry on rising? In general, I'd expect the deaths to continue to keep going up for about two weeks after the intensive care picture improves. And so uh, we're not there yet in terms of knowing exactly when that will be, but that's the sort of time frame I'd expect. Coach from Sky. I suspect Britain needs a little bit of hope going into this Easter weekend. Um, to Dominic Raab, Will the government set out in public the principles that will guide you when you do finally come to lifting this lockdown? Angela Merkel, the German uh, Chancellor, said today that the German government would do that next week. Can you commit to doing something similar? And to uh, Chris Whitty, um, two or three weeks ago, you were very concerned about the speed that the coronavirus was ripping through communities. Can you say how fast it is now um, going and being transmitted? Uh, has that transmission rate now come down or is it still going through uh, Britain as fast as it was? Thanks, Sam. Well, look, the positive is that I think as we hopefully set out clearly, we can show people that all the sacrifices that they've been made and all the um, forbearance that they've shown has made a real difference. It has saved lives. It has helped protect the NHS. Um, we're obviously not on the same uh, point along the peak as the Germans, so I, I'm not sure that the direct analysis works, but what we will do is continue to be followed by the evidence and the science, and as we've always said, and as I said earlier, we'll take the right decisions at the right moment in time. Um, answering directly the question that you asked about the speed, uh, at the time when I was first talking about this, uh, the doubling time, how fast we were doubling in terms of numbers, particularly in intensive care, was around about three days, varied a bit. This has got steadily longer in time over the last two weeks, thanks to what people have done. And as Sir Patrick showed in the data, this is really now becoming not quite flat, but it is doubling time is now six or more days in almost everywhere in the country and uh, extending in time. That is that would that has only happened because of what everybody has done, what we've all done in terms of staying at home and only going out to work, exercise, and uh, critical uh, shopping and medical care. If I can just add one thing in terms of the principles, and this is not principles uh, except in the narrow uh, sense of health, I think it's important to remember that there are the direct effects of people dying from coronavirus, and this uh, has been affected by people helping to pull the curve down, but there are also indirect effects which have to be taken into account when we're thinking about the health effects over the long term, those include uh, the indirect effects were the NHS to be overwhelmed and because of people's actions, 
the, there is still room in intensive care, there's still room in the emergency services across the country in terms of other health issues. But we also have to remember the effects on uh, things that have to be delayed uh, to free up uh, NHS space. And we have to think about the effects uh, of, of, of the long-term health effects of some of the economic measures. And these are all health things, and there are other economic and other things that need to be taken into account by ministers. But for me as a doctor, I'm thinking about health things. All of these need to be taken into account in working out how is the best way to go to the next stage in this epidemic. If I could also come in there, Please. Chris spoke about the doubling time in intensive care, which has got longer. If you look in the community, at the moment, you'd expect there to be no doubling time. This is not doubling. In the community, you would expect this now to be shrinking for all the reasons I've said, and the evidence suggests that that's what's happening in terms of the transmission in community. So that's all points in the right direction, and the doubling time in ICU is a reflection of what's happening earlier and the efforts that have been made in terms of social distance. Sam, did you want to follow up? Um, just in terms of, of publishing the principles that we will uh, rely on, perhaps not next week, because we are, as you say, in a different place to Germany, but will the British government at some point explain to the British people uh, in a document um, the trade-offs and the evidence about how they're going to go about lifting the lockdown? Well, well, look, we'll make the right decisions at the right moment and we'll be guided by the science. I think that's really all I'd say at this point. But just remember, I think the, the focus, and, and we don't want to see any distraction from that, as we look forward to the long uh, bank holiday weekend, is just to, picking up on the evidence that uh, Patrick and Chris have set out, is not to take our eye off the ball, not to undo all the good work, not to uh, undo the sacrifices so many people have made by uh, uh, becoming more lax or uh, failing to follow the guidance at just the moment where we need to make sure we double down, follow the guidance, get through this peak. I think that's the most important thing right now. Hannah Miller from TV Granada. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. Two questions for you. Today, Greater Manchester Police revealed that last weekend they received reports of more than a thousand gatherings. How can they possibly be expected to police that when around a fifth of their staff are not in work? And secondly, I want to talk to you about furling. We've spoke, furloughing, sorry. We've spoken to a blind warehouse worker in Rochdale called Joe. He's worried about being able to socially distance and he's being told to go in or to take unpaid leave. The government said it wants employers to take socially responsible decisions. Does that sound socially responsible to you? I don't, I don't know all the details of the case, but it sounds like a very vulnerable individual. We provide the support to employers. We know they're under pressure and we want all businesses to do the right thing. We're doing our bit and I think it's important for us all to pull together and particularly for the most vulnerable uh, in our communities. Um, so I want people to think, uh, employers to think long and hard if they have people like that um, who they're employing uh, and who are within their care in a broader sense. Um, on the uh, issue, I think it was Greater Manchester Police, um, the police are doing a great job and it's a very difficult line for them to walk um, but uh, I think they're doing a, a terrific job and above all as we go into this long bank holiday weekend I think people should think very long and hard not just about the guidance and the importance of keeping up but about what happens to those uh, on the NHS front line uh, who are doing a heroic job if people uh, in large numbers don't comply with those rules and I would urge everyone just to take a moment uh, before they do anything, however warm it is, however great the temptations, just to think about the sacrifices those on the front line, particularly in our NHS, are making. Do you want to come Thank back you. again? Um, yeah, thanks. Just on the furloughing um, and guidance around people with disabilities, do you accept that the guidance around social distancing for people with disabilities perhaps needs to be looked at in a bit more detail? Well, we can certainly take another look at it, but it, of course it's the way it's applied that's really important with a, uh, a flexibility and, uh, again, as I said, a sense of the fact that we're all in this together and we've pulled through this together. Um, so um, we can always look at the guidance. We want to make sure it's as clear as possible, but it's the way it's implemented as well, which is really important. Ben Kentish from LBC. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. You talked about the sacrifices that NHS workers are making and we're hearing more stories of that today, people losing their lives. In some cases, they're telling us because they haven't got the right equipment. Now, to thank them for that work, thousands of people around the country tonight would take part in the cap for our, clap for our carers. 
But I wondered if today you could go further and commit to when this crisis is over, giving them a real reward, a financial thank you for the sacrifices and the efforts that they're making on behalf of us all. And if I may, can I ask the Chief Scientific Advisor, um, Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, mentioned last week that a surveillance study was being carried out with an antibody test that's been developed by Public Health England. Could you tell us what the early results of that show in terms of how many people in Britain have had the virus and how many would you expect to have had it in the 12 to 18 months or so until a vaccine is developed? Thank you. Well, I think they're really good points. Um, I think the carers and all those in the front line, as I uh, pay tribute to in my early remarks, have done an amazing job. We're obviously doing everything we can uh, to provide the equipment, the PPE that they need. We're rolling that out at pace. We're, uh, you know, I recognise that there have been challenges with the distribution. We've got a helpline, uh, but most importantly, we've, um, we, we're really rolling that out in pace. We've got the military involved uh, where that's uh, appropriate. Uh, I'll be taking part in the clap for carers this evening. And you're, you're right, there will be a moment where we look at how we formally recognise uh, all of those in the front line have done so much to pull us through this very difficult period for our country. On the surveillance test, so this is the antibody test, the first thing to say is these tests are difficult to get right. So, so they're across the world, people are trying to get really specific and sensitive tests on this, and that's uh, a lot of collaboration across the world to do that. Um, the scientists in Public Health England have, have worked on this, and yes, there is a surveillance study underway. Um, I don't know the results yet, they're not out. Uh, this will uh, continue until we've got the right results and they're able to communicate them. And of course, they will communicate them like all good scientific practice as soon as they're ready and they know um, what, what they show and they can validate that these are reliable results. So that's what's going on at the moment. And in terms of you know, how many people would you expect to get this before a vaccine or treatment comes along? I think the processes that we've got in place are clearly to suppress the number. And the idea is to try and keep that number as low as possible. Do you want to come back on any of that, Ben? If I may, uh, Foreign Secretary, just you said there will be a time to reward NHS workers. I wondered if you just might spec that on a personal level, what, you, what form you think that should take. I, I do think it's important while they're doing this great job uh, and, and we're all trying to focus on getting us through the peak that we keep our, um, our focus and our attention on that. Um, and, and, and I'd want to give it proper thought with all of the other people uh, in government. But what I would say is I think we all recognise the enormous sacrifice they've made, uh, how much it's done to help pull us through, uh, even to this level, how much it's done to avoid some of the worst scenarios we could have otherwise faced. And I'm sure there'll be the you know, appropriate level of recognition at the right moment once we're through the, the worst of it. All right from the Times. Uh, thank you. Um, a question first to Professor Whitty, if I may. Um, we know that the daily death figures that you're reporting come from the NHS, um, but we're expecting next week figures from the Office of National Statistics, which will be wider than that. Um, do you expect that when you take into account care homes and other settings that we'll see a significant rise in the, in the total death rate? And just to follow up on, um, on Ben's point with um, Sir Patrick, uh, John Newton said last week on this antibody study that's been carried out at Port and Down that they were days away from having preliminary results. Uh, you say that you haven't seen the results, but would you anticipate that those results will be made available to the SAGE committee that will advise ministers on the next stage in the lockdown? Um, on the uh, NHS figures versus the ONS figures, so they, they measure different things. Uh, the reason the NHS figures are very useful for us is we can get them very fast uh, and they are collected in the same way the whole time and they're very comparable actually to international figures uh, which tend to be collected in the same way. So what that allows us to do uh, is what Patrick was doing at the beginning which is to see in relatively near time uh, the trends over time because it's a steady, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very stable uh, way of collecting the data. ONS data collects a much, and, and those uh, NHS figures are all people who are proven to have coronavirus on testing, so they're definitely cases in hospitals. The ONS figures are much wider than that. I would therefore expect them, it's not just that they go further outside hospital, they also include uh, people who have sadly died where the doctor thinks that coronavirus may be involved even if there is no test uh, involved in that decision. Uh, and I would expect those numbers to be higher, but because it takes longer for the data to come in, 
it, it's always going to be a lag behind, behind, between those two amounts, which makes the ONS data extremely useful for looking at the wider picture, but the NHS data is more useful for us to make decisions day to day and to make decisions, for example, about what we need to change uh, in terms of our current interventions. And the answer to the question is, yes, of course, we would expect to see those results in SAGE, and we'll see them when they are ready and the studies have been completed and they've been properly analysed. And, and we spend a lot of time looking at this from across the world as well. I uh, had uh, calls with colleagues from many countries earlier in this week on this very topic. had a call last night with somebody from Stanford University doing working in this area. This is something we look at right the way across the world all the time. And of course, the PHE results will come to SAGE when they're ready. Do you want to come back on any of that or no? I just would like to ask you, Mr. Robert, if possible, have you managed to have any contact um, with the Prime Minister um, since you took over his responsibilities at all? Not yet. I think it's important to, uh, particularly while he's in um, intensive care, to let him focus on recovery. We in the government have got this covered. Um, I chaired the COBRA meeting that I've just come from. Uh, we're pursuing all the different strands uh, of our strategy to defeat the coronavirus and uh, I'm confident we'll get there. George Parker from the FT. Question for the Foreign Secretary. I'd like to ask you about the Bank of England's decision today to effectively extend its overdraft facility to the government. We're told this is a temporary measure, but nevertheless, it's very unusual. Can you explain exactly why the government needs this facility? And is it possibly because the cost of your economic interventions to address the crisis are costing more than you expected? particularly the job retention scheme. And separately, a question for Professor Whitty. We heard today from the US scientific equipment maker, Thermo Fisher, they have a, an agreement with the government to supply 100,000 swab tests a day at least. Can I just check that is correct? And if so, what are we waiting for? So George, on the Bank of England decision, obviously we've got an independent Bank of England. Um, they make those decisions autonomously. Uh, as you said, it's a temporary measure, but the broader picture is from the fiscal measures that the Chancellor has taken through to the measures taken by the Bank of England. We want to make sure that we're in the best position, uh, not just uh, to see uh, us through this crisis from a health point of view, as important as that is, but also from an economic, uh, economic point of view. And we're making sure that we use all the levers across government to, uh, to achieve that. On, on the testing, we're ramping up every day on the testing, but I think it's important to, uh, to differentiate between uh, tests available and ready to run and the whole system running in terms of in the lab and actually having the whole system running so you're very confident that someone who needs a test uh, can order the right test and get the right result back. And the whole process is going up every single day this month. I expect to see an increase in the number of tests that uh, go out and the number of results that come back including Thermo Fisher, but not only Thermo Fisher. There are quite a few other groups uh, who are involved in this. Want to follow up there, George? Yeah, just a very quick one to, to Chris Whitty. I mean, doesn't this really reflect the fact that the problem lies in our laboratories, not through any, for example, shortage of chemicals, which is something that Michael Gave Gove said last week. And Mr. Ra, very quickly, something going back to your earlier opening remarks, mm. you said that the pictures will have to stay in place until we have clear evidence that clearly shows we have moved beyond the peak. Should we assume, therefore, that once we have evidence that shows we have moved beyond the peak, that the restrictions will start to be eased? Well, I, I, I think the whole point is not to make assumptions, but to be guided by the evidence when we've got it. I don't know, Chris, would you want to uh, In terms of kit, I mean, both, uh, there was a period when both uh, swabs and reagents were in short supply. That's beginning to sort itself out. That doesn't, sort that, but, you know, a, a testing process is a long chain of which actually doing the test is in the middle of it, but there are large parts either side. Uh, but the, uh, you're absolutely right that that was a, a barrier. It's much less of a barrier, although it has not gone away completely, but it is a lot better than it was. Thanks, George. Hugo, Hugo Guy from the, uh, from the Eye. Uh, thank you. Foreign Secretary, can I just ask you to uh, clarify the extent of your own authority uh, in the Prime Minister's absence? We're aware you're chairing uh, the committees and the cabinet that he would normally do. Are you authorised to make big decisions, for example, on uh, lifting the lockdown, uh, a decision that's going to have to come next week, if the Prime Minister is, is still unavailable? Can you make that decision in the same way that he did, uh, that he would do? Um, and Sir Patrick, can I just ask, um, 
as you pointed out, the uh, mass su surveillance testing uh, results are not, are not yet um, available. Do you have any estimate at all for how many people uh, in the UK have probably been infected with coronavirus? Uh, or are we just still flying blind on that point? Um, um, so thanks very much, Hugo. Look, we've got, I've got all the authority I need to make the relevant decisions, uh, whether it's through chairing uh, cabinet updates, as I did earlier in the week, chairing COBRA, or indeed the meetings of more, uh, the morning meetings of senior ministers. Uh, we've got a great team. It's a team effort. Um, obviously, it's not exactly the same as when the Prime Minister was here. That's very clear. Um, but as his first secretary deputised to discharge his responsibilities, we've got all the authority we need. I think in, ter in terms of the test, one of the reasons it's so important to get that test out is to try and work out the proportion of people who may have had the disease asymptomatically. I think across the world, it's looking less likely that it's a very high number. So it's not likely that it's 90% of people have had it asymptomatically. Much more likely it's lower than 50. Could be around 30, but we don't know for sure. And in terms of the number of people who've had it in each country, that's why the antibody test is so important. There are beginning to be some stories of people getting answers to that question. Again, I wouldn't expect that to be a high percentage. And most of the figures that come out so far are low single digit percentages, but we need to see. There are a couple of examples of slightly higher percentages than that, but these are early data and we need to make sure that we've got the right information. Would you like a supplementary there, Hugo? Yeah, so can I just clarify, Sir Patrick, I appreciate the, the, the picture is still unclear, but you would expect it to be, for example, well under 10%, probably, of people in the UK have been, have been infected uh, by comparison to uh, the situation in other countries. Is that, is that fair enough? I, I can't tell you what the answer is going to be. We need to do the experiment, find out the answer, but um, from what I've seen from other places, it's mainly single-digit numbers, and it could be a bit higher in some places. Andrew McCaskill from Reuters. Uh, many thanks. So I've got two quick questions for the advisors. Uh, first for Sir Patrick. Um, why did your marketing committee, as members told Reuters, uh, not begin reviewing and modelling the consequences of the full lockdown across the country until mid-March? And for Chris Whitty, could ask Britain created a coronavirus test on January the 10th. Why did it take more than two months to contact many lab labs to ask them to create capacity to carry out tests? Thank you. Um, Maybe I'll tell you what happened, and, and that's the easiest way to answer the question, which is we started working on this in January. Um, we had our first uh, full SAGE meeting in January. We had a pre-SAGE before, uh, uh, before the 24th, I think it was, of January. We had an earlier meeting, and in February we modelled all of the interventions that you've now seen. And those interventions were modelled, looked at in SAGE, including scenarios of full lockdown to push the peak out to autumn. They were done throughout February. That's why in early March, it was possible for um, the Department of Health and Social uh, Care to publish a, an action plan, which included all of the measures and reported that all of these might be necessary at some point, and they needed to be put in the right combination and in certain orders to get the maximum benefit. So uh, it, it's not correct that we didn't model it till March. Um, we modeled it throughout February, and that was, of course, is what led to the action plan. Yeah, on testing, I mean, you've got to remember, this is a completely new virus initially. From the time that actually uh, the Chinese scientists put the um, uh, genotype on the web, which was a fantastic first step, we moved incredibly quickly to get a first test. Uh, there was quite a rapid ramp up, but it initially had to start off to be sure the test worked. To make a point which I've made before, getting a test that's inaccurate is really unhelpful. So we had to be confident about that. And then it was rolled out uh, in stages and it continues to be rolled out in stages and will continue all the way through this month. Andrew, would you like a final question? Yeah, just to follow up on that point, uh, we were told by, uh, this is the Sir Patrick, John Edmonds told us that uh, neither him or Neil Ferguson carry out any uh, modelling for the lockdown and, until March. I'm just wondering why there's that discrepancy there. Well, uh, um... I'm not gonna, I don't know exactly what John said to you and what he didn't say to you. I know what happened and I've just told you what happened and the modelling came in from a variety of sources. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you all very much.